diagrams of the dryers that uh, was in that package I sent out. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the circuits that are found inside of those dryer diagrams because that's what becomes the most confusing. So I broke down um, portions of the, the diagram so I can identify different things that's going on here. Then when we trace the circuits, then we can discuss uh, the tracing of those circuits. Um, if we uh, look here, this is the drive motor um, and the buzzer and a timer switch. And if you look at it, when you were to trace the circuit, some of you went here and did the circuit for the motor like so. But some may have gone through the buzzer too. And if you looked at the answer, the answer says, oh, in that circuit, the buzzer is not energized right now or does not have a path. And, and that is true. And let me explain to you why. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. Let me just draw the diagram. So the buzzer itself, being a little square box, the buzzer itself has very high resistance. I would say between 2,000 and 3,000 ohms of resistance. So that's very high resistance. Now, just take one ohm as an example of a kink in a hose. So if I'm talking about 2,000 or 3,000 ohms, I'm expanding the amount of kinks very high. The more kinks I have, the slower the electricity can travel through it. So the thing is, is like, well, how come the buzzer's not working though? I see there's a path here through the buzzer and then through the motor. Well, the motor becomes the division between line one and neutral in this circuit. What does it take to make this motor run? I need line one here at the motor and I need neutral on the other side in order for that motor to work. If we look at the buzzer, power comes down here and goes up to the buzzer so is this line one or neutral on the BS side of this diagram anybody know right here what is this line one or neutral line one line one okay so if line one is here I would need neutral over here but let me go back to my marker for a second because I said this red line is neutral coming in here and going up to that motor. So if I went here and went back this way, would this also be line one? This is not neutral. Neutral is kept here on this side of the motor. So therefore, we have two line ones on that diagram going to this buzzer, the buzzer will not work. And you're like, okay, so the buzzer's not working, so when does the buzzer work? Well, when do you normally hear the buzzer in a dryer? Anybody know? When it's finished? When it's finished? Yeah, at the end of the cycles when the buzzer works, <laughs> So if I'm going to redraw that diagram here, we have something called a centrifugal switch. Now let me go here and just make that timer switch real quick and then I'll explain this circuit and what's going on here. So the centrifugal switch here when we had our lecture yesterday, I brought it up and said I'd explain it to you. I, it could be drawn many different ways, but these arrows in the diagram are actually telling you something. If we, if we didn't have it, and I'm going to draw it the other way vertical. It's, it doesn't matter which way I draw it. I'm going to draw this centrifugal switch this way where it's making contact from this point to this point and not the top one. And then I'm going to draw an arrow pointing up and a curved arrow. The curved arrow means when the motor starts to rotate that's what that curved arrow means. The second arrow means 
when the motor starts to rotate, the second arrow is telling you the position that that switch is going to go when that motor is running. So in this case, this is the position when the motor is not running that the switch is down here. But once it starts to run, the switch goes up, and then that same switch would look like this. It would make contact to the top one and not the bottom one. And this is what that switch would look like when it's running. I know my drawing is not perfect, but that's how it would look like when it's running. So this centrifugal switch is providing a path for my buzzer. And we said that the resistance of that is about two to 3,000 ohms. The dryer motor resistance is only about three to 10 ohms. Three to 10 ohms of resistance, very low. Now, when this switch is closed, the electricity bypasses the buzzer, goes straight to the motor. That puts line one right at this point coming into the motor. Okay? So what happens? The dryer's running, the timer's running, and the timer says, hey, the cycle's about... Hold on. So the timer here is going to say, hey, turn the dryer off. So what does it try to do? It tries to stop the power from going to the motor. At that point, we no longer have line one coming in the back door to this buzzer. Line one is here, neutral is here, but now we have two loads. How are these loads wired together right now? Are they in series with each other or are they parallel to each other? Anybody know? Give you a hint. Series. They're in series. Very good. They're in series with each other. Uh, I E S. They're in series with each other. Now, when electricity looks at multiple loads in series, what happens is it doesn't know you have two pieces in series. It's almost like if I have two light bulbs here, for example, one after the other, the electricity doesn't say, oh, now I got to go through two light bulbs. What it does is it takes the resistance of each bulb, and let's just say 10 ohms, for example, 10 ohms, and it adds it up so it actually looks at the circuit like it's one big bulb and that big bulb is 20 ohms. So that's how electricity sees it. It doesn't even know that there's a piece of wire in between. It, it, it cannot distinguish between two, three, four, five in series. The only thing that happens is when the resistance value of both those loads are the same, the voltage is going to be split evenly for each load. So if I have 120 volts, this one's going to have 60 volts, and this one's going to have 60 volts. Now, if I had a circuit of two bulbs in series, and one bulb is 2,000 ohms, and one bulb is only 10 ohms, well, that's a lot of kinks. So what happens is this resistant is creating a voltage drop. So it, this one here is going to rob all the voltage, and because the resistance is so high, it's going to slow down what? What does the resistance slow down in an electrical circuit? It slows down the current or the amperage. So if I have 2,000 ohms here, by time the electricity flows through here, it slows down so much, this light bulb is going to get very little power and barely glow. That's what happens here. When this timer switch opens in the circuit, the voltage is forced through this buzzer, which is very high resistance, and then by the time it gets to the motor, the motor doesn't have enough voltage to keep itself going. The buzzer is buzzing currents flowing through the motor. This buzzer is basically just using the motor as an electrical path. And then when that happens, this centrifugal switch here is going to open up and go back to the rest position and the motor is going to be off. 
No power can get through the timer, no power can get through the buzzer, the motor dies and loses its power and the buzzer stops buzzing. So in your diagram, if the timer switch is closed and the motor's running, the buzzer is not working. If this timer switch is open, then the electricity is forced through the buzzer and then through the motor to make it work. Now there is a typo in this diagram and it's the way they drew that buzzer that that little line right there should not be there. If you look at mine, the line goes here and up into the buzzer and then comes back out here. There isn't a connecting line through there. They should not have drawn that. That is a typo, but if you did your the symbols that I sent to you, um, I'm sorry guys, I sent it out today. I thought it went out and then I saw it sitting in my, my outbox. I sent it later today. Um, you'll see that this, the buzzer symbol is this. Now, if we go just a little bit further, this symbol right here, and I'll zoom in on it, or not symbol, but this component right here is a buzzer on a Whirlpool dryer. That's this little piece right here. It has two wires, and the current flows through this and through the motor in order to make that buzzer work. So I'm going to explain these different circuits and then I'll go over the actual diagrams once I've explained the different portions of the circuits, okay? So that is how the buzzer in this circuit works. Now let's take a look at this portion of the circuit. I don't have the buzzer drawn because what happens is you're going to take your timer and, you, and oops, sorry, I have my drawing tool. You, take your timer and you're gonna go time dry and you got a couple things here 60 minutes 50 40 minute off or whatever and you turn your timer to 50 minutes time dry you're gonna close this switch and you're gonna close this switch here this right here is called a push to start relay drives have two basic types of starting switches. One is a relay and one is a momentary contact. This one is called a relay. A relay is made up of two electrical components. One is a coil or solenoid and the other is a switch. And then we draw a dotted line meaning that this is mechanically linked together so when current flows through this coil the magnet pulls the switch closed and as long as this magnet is getting power this switch will stay closed and I'll draw it again over here so as long as there's power going through this one here this switch will close and keep that contact close which is this one here and here's the dotted line so we'll actually like put a dotted line here so when this dryer is off this switch is open you press the switch to start the dryer not only does it create a path for the motor to get power but it also creates a path for this magnetic coil because if this coil does not energize and you let go of that switch that switch will open back up and the motor won't run. So the way this thing works is that the dryer is going to get to the end of the cycle. This timer here is going to open up and allow the buzzer to work for about 15-20 seconds until the power to the motor drops enough the motor can't spin around anymore and then centrifugal switch goes back to this position so there's no power here and no power here and in the next few minutes the timer will open this up and when it does its purpose is to kill the power to the relay coil here and cause that push to start switch to open up so this circuit here we've got a lot of things going on we got a timer switch here which has to do with the buzzer and this timer switch here, instead of stopping the motor, this timer switch stops the push to start relay. And that switch will open up and stop the motor from operating. Okay? So let's look at the next diagram. So 
Now let's get down to the timer motor. Right here, this is line one. This line here is neutral, and this line here is line two. So between line and neutral is 120 volts. Between line one and line two is 240 volts. So if we use time drive, oops, time drive, this timer contact will close. And that will allow power to come here for the timer motor and go out to neutral, giving the timer motor 120 volts AC. Timer will run for 50 minutes or whatever we said we put the timer to, and the timer will open this contact. If you look at this to the BG contact, if we go back, it is also the BG contact that kills the power to my relay, relay coil. So this contact here is the same one as this contact here. One switch will kill the push to start relay. This will kill the timer motor. So what is this power resistor? Does anybody know how the power resistor works in this circuit? Yes, no, at least say no if you don't know. <laughs> okay. Ross, you know it, I know you do. Auto Will drive. Will it power from line one? Well, sort of. Watch what happens here. If we don't close this switch here for the timer, the timer has to go a different way for power. And the path is this way. It goes through the power resistor, goes through the heater, and goes to line two. But that's 240 volts. If we have 240 volts going to this motor, which was designed to run off of 120, we burn that motor out. Okay? So the purpose of this power resistor is to drop the voltage the same way the buzzer and the motor being in series. If I put these two in series, plus the heater, which is very little resistance, it'll drop the voltage to the timer motor to about 97 volts AC. That's approximately the voltage you're going to get on that timer motor. Now, here is an example right here, this piece with the circle on it, of a power resistor. So if you see that little thing with the two black wires on it, you're like, what the heck is that? What is it? It's not the buzzer. What is this piece doing? It's the power resistor in the circuit. Now, I'm going to go a little bit more how the circuit works, but I have another page here with some power resistors. Power resistors come in all shapes and sizes. This is a power resistor. This one here is connected directly to the timer. So is this one. This is another power resistor. It looks like this one here attached to the, to the control panel. And this is a power resistor here with the timer as a kit. So the power resistors can look all different ways. So we got an issue here. Remember I told you that buzzer would not work until that timer switch opens. Well, guess what? If I go in auto dry, if I look at the alternate path, which let me use a marker to show the alternate path here. If I go this way through here, through the thermostats up to the heater, that makes this circuit line one. Because there is no load or resistor in this path. A thermostat or a switch is the same as a piece of wire. They just let electricity through. So everything here is line one. So if that's the case, line one will come back up all the way to this power resistor. And line one is also here. So I do not have a neutral or a line two. I need to have a potential difference for electrical current to flow. So when all these switches are closed, the power is going right to the heater here. And I'm going to use a different color just to distinguish. 
and come out the other side giving the heater 240 volts AC oops that's supposed to be 240 let me fix that 240 volts AC putting line 2 here and line 1 here so when we first turn on the dryer in an automatic dry and I'll explain to you how this works and what it does now when we first turn it on the timer is not advancing the motors running turning the clothes moving the air and all these switches are closed so my heater is getting a full 240 volts of power and the heater is heating the clothes and drying the clothes but our operating thermostat is 160 degrees and at one point the dryer temperature is going to reach 160 going out the back and that's going to cause this timer switch or I mean this thermostat to open and when it does what happens to my line one it's no longer there I lose line one once that thermostat opens it stops right here at the terminal HT1 that forces the timer motor to go through the power resistor and the heater as a path and that's when we get that 97 volts AC so once this thermostat opens I do have electrical current going through the heater right now but the power resistor and the timer both being 2000 plus ohms of resistance both of them take up so much power there's very little voltage to the heater you're lucky if you get about six to seven volts AC at this point so the heater is not getting hot it has electricity but not 240 so the timers running now what happens if the heaters not heating my temperature was 160 but now the temperature starts to drop my thermostats going to see that and close again because it dropped below 160 and I'm going to have current flow back to here my timers going to stop so what happens in auto dry and I'm just gonna say auto what happens in auto dry is when the heater is on timer is off and when the heater is off the timer is on what type of advantage would this be over time dry because you know what both time dry and auto dry are going to cycle at 160 degrees because that's what that thermostat says and if you got a towel that dries in 35 minutes at 160 degrees it doesn't matter if you use time dry or use auto dry guess what it's still gonna dry the same amount of time so what is the advantage of auto dry and why does a manufacturer even add auto dry if it doesn't get any hotter the motor doesn't run any faster it doesn't move any air any faster it takes so much time to get the moisture out of a dry a towel or t-shirt or pants it's not going to make it go any faster what is the advantage behind that anybody know it sells units yeah that is one thing and in the consumer industry I'm sure all of you are the same way you uh, go and you want to buy a, a nice stereo for your home and if it only has three buttons on it and then and the, the same brand next to it has 30 buttons on it you're like oh I want this one over here I can do more things with it I'm gonna be honest with you how many times have you guys bought something that had all these bells and whistles and buttons on it and didn't even use half of the buttons I you know if you wash your own clothes you probably wash on the same cycle for everything the same price like you said then you know why not well if I can add more cycles I can increase the cost of the product right higher demand yeah so they're making money but believe it or not automatic dry actually does have an advantage because when you first put the clothes in they're gonna be more wet and because of their wetness they take longer for the dryer to 
get hot inside the drum. In that case, this switch will be closed and the timer won't run. But once it reaches temperature, this opens up and now the timer starts moving. Now the clothes are so wet, they're going to cool the air down very fast as that moisture of the clothes are in the air. And this is going to close again, the timer is going to stop. So at the beginning of the cycle, when the clothes are real wet, the timer isn't going to run that much. The timer is going to run, but not that often. But as the clothes start to dry and give up their moisture, the heater is going to heat the drum a lot faster and the heater is not going to run as much so the timer runs more. So on automatic dry when you look at the cycle instead of little buttons saying 60 minutes 40 minutes it says more dry and then less dry and then off. The more and less dry if you just go a little bit about to more it's supposed to like guesstimate how much moisture is in your clothes. Now, if you just looked at your time dry and put some towels and stuff in there in a regular load and tested the dryer, put it for 50 minutes, but after 25 minutes, stop the dryer, see how dry your clothes are. Say, yeah, they should maybe run another five minutes. Then at 30 minutes, open it up and see if the clothes are dry again. You say, oh, wow, you know, they're just about done. Let me give it like five more minutes, 35 minutes. Okay, I open up 35 minutes, everything's dry, I can go. Next time you use time dry, just put it to 35 minutes. If you use it often enough, you'll start to figure out what cycles or time you need to run, and you could just put it for 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and it'll be just fine. Your clothes are not going to dry any faster, but if we put this circuit in here, we can add a cycle and the customer thinks they're getting something a lot more than really what's happening. You know, it's just more buttons on that dryer. So, let's take a look at something else in this circuit. Now I'm erasing this stuff, but remember I'm recording this video so you guys can watch it later if you want. Okay, so now we have the operating thermostat. This is a picture of the operating thermostat right here. But notice the thermostat has one, two, three, four terminals on it. And this thermostat right here only has two terminals. But I'm going to tell you, this thermostat is that thermostat. So what are these other two terminals on that thermostat? What do they go to? Anybody know? These two here, Ross. <laughs> what do these smaller terminals go to? You guys can't see it. Do you want me to expand the part a little bit so you can see it better? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and expand it a bit. I'm just moving the diagram up a little bit so you can see everything. Or wouldn't those be used if the voltage was going to be different or something? No. If you look at the terminals, these terminals are a lot bigger. They're going to be right here and right here. And the reason why they're that big is because they're handling 240 volts and the amperage for the heater. With that 240 volt circuit, the amperage is very high. These two are the switch inside of the timer. Here. Okay. Now, if you look at these two smaller ones, they're BH and BH1. These two terminals here, they're smaller. They're called a thermostat heater. Now, wait a minute. Why put a heater inside the thermostat? Inside this little box, there is a heater here running in between these two components. Now I'm going to copy this image here and go to another page just to show you what it is and then we'll talk about the circuit of it. So 
So on the bottom of this thermostat, and I think I talked about this Saturday, on the bottom of the thermostat is a bimetal, which is a round flat disc called bimetal. And bi meaning two, it's actually two different metals sandwiched together. If you guys ever get an old thermostat, just bust it apart and you're going to see a little flat piece of metal inside of the thermostat. But as hot air flows across the bottom of that thermostat, and, and the piece looks like this, it's lowered into the air, and here's the top half up here, that it causes one of the two metals to warp and that flat metal going from this position now looks like this. It f pops up. And on top of it is a plastic pin and there's a switch here and I'm going to draw a little point on the bottom of it and there's another point here for another switch or another side of the switch here and this and this come up to those two metal prongs here and here. I'm just going to call it A I'm going to call this A and this is B and this is B here. So if you look at this thermostat here this is just two pieces of metal touching together and allowing electricity to flow through now, once it gets hot, this disc, oops, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take this piece separately, but I, my tool's not allowing me to do that now. Anyways, once this piece pops up, and I'm going to redraw it, once this piece pops up, like this, it's going to push this piece up. Oh, I can't do it. It's going to open up this contact right in between here and stop electricity from flowing through it. Now that is at 160 degrees. Now if we go back to our diagram, we have this funky looking piece here. That is our temperature selector switch. The temperature selector switch has three positions. Remember the water temperature switch we talked about the other day? We have AH to AH1. We have AH to AH3 and we have AH to AH2. Can anybody tell me what the temperature positions are for those switches? Like what do you think they would use for the words? If I close AH to AH1 I'm closing or I got this switch here. This would be air dry. what that means is no heat and when you when you put the switch to air dry it actually will open this contact so that no power will go to the heater and basically the dryer is not going to run with any heat remember who wants to run a dryer without heat your clothes will never dry you might want to tumble some things to like wrinkle it out or just get air to go through it but basically it's just another cycle the manufacturer wanted to add on to it. Now if I close AH to AH2 here I send power to this thermostat heater here and this is going to neutral here so I'm sending 120 volts AC to that heater. That's going to give me low heat in the dryer. I'll explain in a minute what are you talking about. You're turning on a heater and you're going to give me low heat. So let me just talk about the circuits and I'll go over what's going on here. So now 
what if I close the switch from AH to AH3, which is this one here? If I do that, I'm going to put power through this resistor. And what happens, we've talked about two circuits now. We talked about the motor and a power resistor. And we talked the buzzer and the drive motor. What happens when we put two loads in series? What happens to those loads? Someone give me an answer. Someone. It will, it will energize the thermostat heater. Well, it's energized, but what the question is, what happens when two loads are in series? And just like I said, two light bulbs. What happens when I put two loads in series? What happens? They split the power, one will dim out. They split the power depending on the resistance value. So instead, I, when I was here, I'm putting a full 120 volts of electricity to that thermostat heater. But if I go down here, the resistor is going to drop the voltage and that actually is going to put approximately 60 volts to that thermostat heater. And just like a light bulb, if you put elect less electricity to a light bulb, it's not going to get as bright. So if I go through this resistor to the thermostat heater, the thermostat heater is not going to get as hot. It's still going to get hot. So it's going to give me medium heat. Now, I'm going to change this because air dry is when AH and AH1 is open. Let me just, I have to correct myself. Open, that's air. If I close AH to AH1, if it's closed and all these others are open, then you're going to get what they call high heat. So with this thermostat here that we're talking about, uh, gets the other way, this thermostat here, normally the thermostat is a single temperature thermostat. I say 160, this one here is labeled 155 if you can see here on the thing at 155 degrees. That's high heat. But if I turn this thermostat on in here, it's going to add heat inside that thermostat and the heater's right above this thing right here I'm going to trick this bimetal and even though the air outside is 120 degrees I'm going to cause it to open if I put full power to this thermostat heater I'm going to trick the thermostat so if I energize the thermostat heater I'm tricking the thermostat to get lower temperatures. So if we go back to what we said here, medium and low heat, if I put 120 here, this heater is going to get real hot, so it's going to cause the thermostat to open at about 120 degrees. If I go through the power, the, this little resistor inside the temperature switch, I'm only going to put 60 volts, I'm going to trick the thermostat, but it's going to take more heat to trick it, I may get to like 135 degrees. If I don't send power at all, just like we're looking at here, if you look at this at this diagram here, there is no switch closed here and here. The thermostat heater is off. I'm going to get high heat at 155 to 160 degrees. So this circuit here puts two loads or two items in series to trick the thermostat to take a single thermostat and get air only, high heat, low heat, and medium heat. Get three different temperatures from only one fixed thermostat. So that's the purpose of that cycle and that thermostat. All right. So those are the crazy circuits. And now let's go to the diagrams and let's take a look at the diagrams and talk about what's going on I think is this the first one no that's not the first one let me go okay the first dryer diagram is here 
So what we did is we closed the push to start relay and we're going to energize this circuit. So power is going to come in and because this timer switch is closed and this one is open here, the buzzer's not working, I send power right now to these two windings in the motor and they go through this switch to neutral. Oops. I want to be a little more accurate here. My drawing's a little, a little off. And goes down here to this circuit. I'm also going to go through here, through the relay, and to this. Now, some people say, well, if the buzzer's not working here, how come the relay coil's working? If we were to simplify that diagram, we have a timer switch we have a motor, we have another timer switch, and we have the relay coil here, and then we got just a little fuse, and then out. Instead of putting the relay coil here, I drew it here. If you look, that puts the two of them parallel, so each one of them are getting full 120 volts AC. And then the push to start relay switch, and out to neutral. So this is going to get full power, even though it's up and down. If I just draw it right here instead, you can see how they're both parallel to each other. They don't go through each other. The next thing is, is my timer motor running? No. Why? Because if we follow this circuit, this switch is open. If this thermostat's closed, it does not go through here power is going to go right around it but the centrifugal switch is in the off position and this one is in the off position so there is no current flowing through here no heater even even if this was open I can't go down the power resistor and through the heater because this switch is open nothing down here is running this is what happens when you first press start on the dryer the motor starts to run the relay engages and close that contact. So in the very first diagram, this is the only thing that is energized. Some of you might think, well, do I have power here still? Yeah, there is electricity here, all the way up to the heater. There is electricity here. If you were to touch that wire, you'd get electrocuted. What these lines are showing is not, is there electricity there? These lines are showing if there's electrical current flowing through those parts from one end of the plug to the other end, whether it's line one to neutral or line one to line two. So in your very first diagram, you should have just energized these two components here. Let's go to the next one. So now you've already pressed start. The centrifugal switch went to this position but the buzzer again is still not working. Why? Because the electricity is just going to go right around it and out to neutral. My relay is still getting power. Now my heater, all these switches here are closed. My heater's on to line two. My timer motor is not running. Even though it has a path, it's waiting for this thermostat to open so it can turn on. So you should not have drawn a line through this timer motor because it's waiting for this thermostat to do its job. Okay? So that's the answer to the second diagram. Now let's look at the last diagram here. Well, I think there's two more. Now the dryer's still running. My motor's still getting power, and it goes out. My relay's getting power, so the coil's holding the relay closed, and my thermostat open. So I do have voltage all the way up to here, but there's no current flow. So now my timer starts to run, and this is the automatic dry cycle and this should be the answer to this page right here okay so thermostat opens timers running thermostat closes timer stops 
heaters getting full power. Even though we're cutting through here, these components again are dropping the voltage to the heater so it's really not producing any heat. It's just creating a path for these two components. Any questions on any of these diagrams so far, please don't hesitate to stop and ask me. I'll ask at the end if you guys want me to go back over something. Okay, so now look, this timer switch opened here. This timer switch opened here. So our heating circuit's open, but our buzzer is buzzing. Our relay contact is closed, and the timer is running. But notice now this switch had closed. So the electricity is going to say, well, do I go through all these kinks in the hose or just go right around and go straight to neutral? Now we go this way and the timer is timing out till it then opens up this last contact and everything shuts off. So now the timer has changed path to the same switch that would be closed in time dry. And that would be that diagram. I'll go back to the beginning, the very first diagram. Does anybody have any questions on this diagram? Or any of these diagrams that we covered or these circuits that we went over? Somebody ask if you got questions. Because then I assume you understand everything I'm showing you. No? Okay. Um, I really have a problem. Go ahead, Christian. What I was going to say, um, well, I'm still trying to, like, stand, um, but you, you, this will also be a recording, too, right? Yeah, I've recorded this lesson, too, yeah. and I will have it uploaded, hopefully, by the end of the weekend. I, I have to edit some things out. Just so you guys know, I set up two separate cameras. I'm only recording the screen that you are seeing. You will not see... Uh, your names or whatever on these presentations so you will not be if you didn't want your name to be shown you won't see it so um, okay I, I mean they might hear they'll hear you talking they'll, they'll hear you ask me questions but they they won't see your your name or your face uh, I will not record that and post that up so do you guys have any other questions on any of these or you just want to watch the videos later <laughs> Actually, um, I don't have any question, but I'm trying to digest in what you just said there. So, um, if question, um, definitely I'll ask it on. Okay, and you can also watch the videos once I post them, and and don't hesitate to email me and ask me any questions, and I'll be more than happy to give you a response and hopefully answer your questions. So this was the dryer diagram. No problem. Thank you. Um, my next lecture for my class is going to be on on Tuesday next week. I will have a class for my full-time students um, tomorrow, but um, that'll be the end of the class for tonight. So if you don't have any questions or if they come up, just um, ask me questions and I will uh, answer you back uh, by email, okay? Other than that, everybody have a good night, all right? Yeah. You too. Okay.